Amen. I want to welcome you to the house of the Lord. My name is um, Mona Stevens. I'm the lead pastor here of Living Hope. And for those that are online, thank you for joining us. Today, God is continuing with the message, part three, Run with Perseverance. And if you've missed part one and two, we are, you can go to our um, website, it's livinghopechurchofgod.org, and it will give you all of the, the, the parts that you've missed. And But today, I'm going to give you a little recap and give you what you've missed a little bit, not a whole lot, but just a little bit so you can follow through on what we're going to be doing today. I truly believe, as I've heard it twice already today, that God is going to send his word and he's going to anoint it. He's going to give power because, you see, he loves us. And he wants us to know who he is. He wants, you to re- he wants to reveal himself to you today. So if you've come, then you're looking for something. You're searching out something. You are looking for clarity and for maybe some understanding. And, and God wants to meet you just where, right where you are today. No matter what is going on in your life, he is here. He wants to meet you right where you are. I, 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 I'm always amazed at his goodness. I'm amazed at how he loves me and how he's merciful and compassionate and forgiving. I have absolutely no no difficulties wanting to serve God because he has proven himself factually with experience in my life that he is who he says he is. And I'm hoping through this series that you would get a new understanding of how we're going to run this race. In the last three weeks, we have been challenged in the scriptures to understand that the Christian life is like a race. And I fell upon this quote. It's a funny quote, but I think this is the dichotomy that goes on when we're running. He says, running is nothing more than a series of arguments between the parts of your brain that wants to stay stop and the part of the other part that wants to keep to keep you going. And, you know, so, you know, we, we go and miss and, you know, we stop and go. And, you know, we put so much focus on our stop and go. But I think we need to look at the bigger picture. You know, perseverance means to never give up to persist no matter how difficult. So have you had a difficult lately? Some of us have been going through journeys of physical ailments. Some of us has been, you know, the mental and emotional strain in our lives, the battle that's within these two, within the, the two ears here. And, and so, so many, many of us, we have a hard time persevering. We have a hard time going forward. See, the question we've pondered together was that if we, we need to run this race, race well, but what will it require for us to run well? Last week, we talked about faith. Now, the Bible teaches us to persevere in faith, trusting God to fulfill his promises while we run this race. Well, you know, there are many things that come against our faith. Unbelief does that. You know, we have disbelief, things that we have picked up that are not even based on the facts, but we believe them nevertheless. We have the lies of the enemy about our identity, about our situation, about who God is. Many things. So Paul encourages Timothy to fight a good fight of faith. He told Timothy to flee things opposed to faith and to fight for worthy things. Oh, I think we need to remind ourselves, hey, John, fight for worthy things. Laura, fight for worthy things. And many times we fight for all the wrong things. Now, we know that Paul is saying to Timothy, fight and flee from those things that oppose the faith that you've been taught. But he also says so that you can actually experience the fullness of eternal life the here and now. It's just, what are you going to experience with the life that God is giving us, that newness of life? You see, many of us run this race in our own strength. We run it in our own wisdom. Or we lean on our, un, on our own understanding. And I saw this quote again. I'm going to share it with you. It says, people have, uh, people have eternal life given by grace through faith in the work of Jesus, but they never really take hold of it that newness of life, that power, that enablement that causes us to run no matter how difficult, no matter how deep the trials are, no matter how high the waves are, the fire is burning, you just know that you know you're going to be okay. See, many, they they don't realize and understand the incredible value of living a life that matters for eternity and the rewards that come with it. You see, when we're living and we're fighting for the right things, 
We're fighting for the right things. There's a lot of things that are available to us, like peace. Who's looking for peace today? Joy, rest from the turmoil that we live in, the day in and day out responsibility. We have these things in Christ, but I think we fight for the wrong things. Then we talked about having the right perspective when it comes to running this race. We, have, we came to the conclusion last week that having a right perspective as we face life's journeys can determine how we run. We talked about Colossians 3, 1, which says, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Now, there was a quote here that I want to share with you with C.S. Lewis when he says this. He says, we must learn to live on the heavenly side and look at things from above, to contemplate all things as God sees them. Have you ever, men- have you ever considered that? Because we don't see a whole lot of things like God sees them. And when you do, then you get to see how Christ beholds everything. That, God, get, that we can overcome sin. That we can defy Satan. We can dissolve the, the, the perplexities of our lives. We can lift ourselves up over the trials. We can separate ourselves from the world and conquer the fear of death. Why? All because when we see things through God, everything changes. It's a game changer. See, the point is this, how we perceive life, people, situations, will affect the way we run this race. So we need to learn to look at things above. The only way we can do that is be a studier of God's word. If we don't know what he sees and how he sees it, then we're going to have a hard time running, and our perspective will always be muddled, or we'll be always stuck in the here and now. Now, Hebrews 12 encourages us to run the race marked before us. We all know, as an athlete, we train and we get our body in shape to complete at the highest level possible. We also work at preparing our minds to actually to compete and to seek and to focus the necessary things that we need to do our task, to train ourselves to get ready to compete. Now, It's amazing that uh, you and I, we don't consider our spiritual training as part as important. And it is. And that's why the challenge was sent since the beginning of the year, not just to do it for three months. We were hoping that you would understand that this is something we will be doing until we see heaven. So did you ever think that you also need to train yourself spiritually for the most important race you are participating in right now? Paul wrote to his friend, his protege, Timothy, to encourage him to continue working on his spiritual life. Why? In the same way that training for a sport is needed to be in shape, training spiritually is necessary to run this race. If we can't do it, we don't train ourselves, we will not run well. An athlete who never thinks about what's next won't be prepared for what's to come. We have to be prepared now for what's to come. We need to build our spiritual training. We need to bring ourselves under that place where God can speak to us now. Because when things get really bad, as they will, because we see it economically, socially, everything that's going around the world, beloved, we cannot stay lazy in our spiritual going. We need to fight for the right things and fighting for our time in the morning or whatever time you want to deem right for you and God is very important. Fighting for our prayer time, fighting for for obedience in our life, fighting for studying the word. We need to understand. We need to do that. Because sometimes when we don't understand our spiritual training is about how we're running, then what we do is we focus on the wrong things. If we want to run with perseverance, spiritual training is very important and it is critical. 1 Timothy 4, 8 says this, For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promises for both the present life and the life to come. When we train ourselves in godliness, now the word godliness means it's reflecting the nature of the kingdom of God in the course of my everyday life. Am I reflecting God's kingdom in the way that I'm responding, in what I'm thinking, how I act, how I speak? 
And so that's what, that, that's what godliness, we're going to train ourselves to do these things. We will, we will begin when we do that, when we start training ourselves, what we do is we start seeing the world through God's perspective. See, I love the way how Paul coaches Timothy to, write for, uh, to fight for the right things, to fight for his spiritual disciplines in his life. We have caused you to be challenged, not to have just an intent or a willingness to do this, because that is not enough. We understood that. But that we had to follow our actions continuously. And last week, I told you that if you came against that wall of running and you found yourself bored or, you know, hesitant or not really, you know, passionate about what we started at the beginning of the year, I told you, just take the sand off your knees and get up and start again. You see, perseverance is you get up and you start start again. It's never about never making mistakes or never failing or goofing up. No, that's just life. But it's to get up. Get up and start again. (coughs) So Paul tells Timothy, you need to develop your spiritual disciplines like prayer and obedience and faith and the study of scripture and the response of the Holy Spirit in your life. Paul wanted Timothy to experience a vibrant life while he was running. And the the result of a vibrant life, if you want to know what that looks like, is really victory, freedom, peace, joy, strength. But yet if we were to examine our life, many of us, because we're really, we're not consistent in that spiritual training, we find ourselves more fighting with defeat and discouragement. No love, a lack of passion, uh, indifference, apathy towards the things of God. What if I told you the spiritual training is not about to get more about uh, God loving you more because he can't love you more than he already does. This is about us experiencing those benefits of the new covenant, the, the benefits of us going forward but seeing differently, loving when it's impossible, forgiving when it's hard, doing what is right before us. Many of us. We can't see it. I ran on, uh, fell on a quote that said this. He says, so therefore, let us run towards heaven by keeping the eyes of our hearts fixed on the one who's already there. Fixed on the one who is already there. The one who has already run the race and came in first. Jesus already run the race and he won. The one who stands victorious in the heavenly places is waiting to share the victory with you. Let us keep our minds and hearts fixated on Christ who holds the prize at the finish line. And you know what the prize is? His presence. Let's not complicate it. It's his presence. Now, I want to go on and tell you about the next thing we will need in finishing the race well. Now I'm going to tell you this next topic is one that many of you will fight with with me. Many of you will not be happy with me at the end of this part. Because we've created our own standard when it comes to this next subject. Are you, is it killing you? <laughs> I'm telling you, I've seen people argue with me until I'm black and blue and I go, ah, I'm sorry, it's in the word. Ah. I'm sorry, this is what God says. And you know what? I'd rather do it God's way than my way because if I look throughout my life, I get to see where I have done it my way and what comes out of it and when I do it God's way and what comes out of it. And you know, when you start getting old, as I am, you start recognizing, you're going, oh, I'm not wasting any more things on the wrong things. Oh, no, 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 no. God has already proven it. Yeah, I might not know what the cost of my obedience will do, but I do know what the results will be. So we're going to go back to Hebrews 12, the first verse we looked at in the first part. It says, therefore, this is the New Living Translation. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us... Strip every, every weight that slows us down, especially every sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Notice that the author of Hebrews says this. Since we are surrounded by such a huge cloud of witnesses to the life of faith, he says, let 
us run. Understanding that it's one particular race and that it's our Christian life that he's talking about and that he says the only way that you will accomplish running well is to run it together. It's to run it with the godly community that God has put before you. Now, most of you know I go to the gym quite often during the week. and I'm hurting today because I went yesterday, and I don't ever want to go with the girl that I went yesterday with because I'm really hurting today. But the fact is, is that there are times I go to the gym and I see these lone rangers doing it all by themselves, and I'm going, man, they're courageous. Because I'd rather be with my community, community of girls who say, hey, no, no, let's do two more sets. What? No, I just don't want to do this anymore. But it's so encouraging to actually train together and so I would choose to train together but this is what really the scriptures are saying it says that togetherness is one of the most important themes in the New Testament it's everywhere in the New Testament in Jesus longest recorded prayer he prayed for us first he prays about our security now if you want to see that in John 17 I'm going to start at John 17 verse 21 to 23 but before that he prays about our security Jesus he was praying for me before I was even born he prays for my security he prays for my sanctity and now his biggest burden was his prayer for unity John 17 21 says this that all of them be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that we, that the world may believe that you have sent me. Then he goes on, verse 22 and 23. I have given them the glory that you have, that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Are you getting it here? I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to what? To complete unity. Then the world, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Wormsby, Wormsby says this, Christians may belong to different fellowships, but they all belong to the Lord and to each other. He goes on to say this, one thing that most impresses the world is the way Christians love each other and live together in harmony. See, that wasn't just my idea. I don't push it because I think that's my agenda. No, this is God's agenda. Jesus prayed for it. He says here, the lost, the lost world cannot see God, but they can see Christians, and what they see in us is what they will believe about God. The point is this. You were never meant to run through life alone. Why is this important to run with others? Well, let me give you three reasons. You know, I could have preached here for four or five hours on this. But I'm going to give you a real recap real quick, so you need to take some notes. Are you ready? This is the part where you'll feel really uncomfortable. I'm giving you a heads up, all right? I love you guys. I'm going to give you a heads up. Are you ready? The first reason why we have to run well together, it's safer. It's safer to walk through life with others. Ephesians 4.16 says this, From whom the whole body joint and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is what? Working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. When you face trouble, community is your, safe, is your safety net. When you face trouble, community is your safety net. When you experience suffering in life, you need people to weep with you. When you are joyful, you need people to be joyful with you. There are situations that nobody should ever go through alone. Nobody should ever have to stand alone at the edge of a gravesite by themselves. Nobody should ever spend the first night alone when their spouse has died or has walked out on them. Nobody should ever go through life stressors alone. The fact is, some of these things are going to happen to you and I, and they are inevitable. You're going to go through tragedy. You're going to go and you're going to receive bad news. You're going to go through heartache. But only a fool would go through life totally unprepared for something that you know is going to happen. 
It's time to build, beloved, this safety net that God so graciously gave us through the resource of community. So many of us, we believe that we could do this without others. So many of us don't understand. I have just gone through in the last three weeks just the, the, the understanding of this beautiful concept of togetherness. I've had people phone, text, write emails. I've had people drop by and just let me know that they're thinking about me and praying for me. I understood in my time of need, I had people ish initiating. And you're saying, well, why is it? Well, it's because she's the leader of the church. Uh-uh. No. Because I believe that when we actually do community well, then we do actually work and equip each other very well as well. So what is God's safety net? It is a group of other believers. You don't need a hundred of them, beloved. All you need is five or six, a group of other believers who are committed to you. This will take a decision to build with other people. I want to tell you a story. There's, there's nobody here. This story doesn't have anything to do with anybody here. Okay? But you will see the reflection and the reality of this story in this church body. I've been here 25 years years yes maybe a little bit more and but I've been in ministry for 36 so and I've seen this reality play over and over and over again are you ready there was a man who went to a particular church for seven years he never got involved with anything never joined small groups just came to worship and then left after service so he said hi and he was cordial to people but he just left one day he had a heart attack and was in a hospital for two weeks Nobody knew, not even the pastor. When he got out of the hospital, he came to the church and he said, I'm very, very bitter and I've decided that I'm going to leave this church because this church is not very friendly. Nobody visited me when I needed someone to come and visit me in the hospital. You see, unfortunately, according to scripture, and I'm going to prove it to you in a few seconds, it was really this man's fault. He never cared about anybody else but himself. Because when we live independently, isolated, it's because you're just thinking about yourself. I am sorry. Christ died for the church. And we are to lay down our life for each other as Christ laid down his life for us. There is no way out of that one, beloved. And the fact is, is that we are, all have difficult relationships in our life. Do we not? And we have to make sure that they, we don't bring in destructive relationship because we have a well-being. God has given us a measure of love to love him and to love others. And that's where boundaries come into play. Boundaries is not about me guarding my heart from love. It is me guarding my heart for love. Do you see the difference? So what we do is we do this. And we don't understand that when we do this, when we're in community, we do life with no one. And so you might come to church and say hi to so-and-so, you might even text, but that's not connecting. It's really walking alongside people, letting people know that you love them, letting them know who you are. I, am, I don't shy away from my struggles from this pulpit because it's not that that defines me. It's who I follow that should define me. And if I do this well, you will see Jesus in my life. You will see the power of God. Just in the last week and a half, I realized that God was saying there are many areas that I've let many people in. But I do know that when God says guard, he says guard my heart for a reason. It's not because I want to do this to people, but there are times when I give access to people and people want something from me that only God could give them, you're gonna, I'm going to remove my access. Because when you put a demand and expectation that only God could do to you, all you're going to do is erode my relationship with you. Because I cannot be God for you. Never said it, never told you I would. But the fact is we are human. The raw truth is that we go to people when we don't believe that God could give us what, he, what he, only he could give. So when you follow through, this man only cared about himself. And those are indicators of pride. See, pride doesn't build relationships. They're too busy self-preserving. It also destroys your safety net. You see, pride and bitterness and all those things, they justify. You see, when I start justifying and excusing and blaming people, I know I'm already in the enemy's camp. I back up and say, whoa, 
I don't blame people. I blame myself. If I haven't guarded myself, it's my fault. If I haven't put in parameters with unhealthy behavior, it's my fault. So for me to walk with you, it takes a intentional pattern of believing that God is who he says he is. He will protect me when you goof up with me. It doesn't matter. I will not stand in a place of bitterness with any one of you. Why? Because I lose if I do. So I choose intentionally to do life with people, even with difficult people. Ouch. Because ultimately, I will walk. I'll never abandon that call to love. That measurement is for you and for me. But so many of us, we've been so broken by our relationships. So many of us, we've experienced. But so many of us, like this man, believed that just coming to church meant that everybody should give him access 100% of the time. But it's not what it is. When God is asking you to love one another, it's based on you doing it because God has asked you to do it. I don't love you so you can love me in return. It feels good, though, by the way. I, I like it. But... I do it because that's who we should be. So this guy, he destroyed his own safety net. This man never cared enough to even meet anybody or invite anybody. He never got into a small group, never gave, never shared. And it was his fault that when the crisis came, nobody was there for him because he never made connections. Oh, when he asked him, he said, well, you know, well, I said hi to people. What else did you want me to do? No, the fact is this story gets played out over and over and over again because we have our own measurements when it comes to relationship. Now, let me show you what Galatians 6 says, 7 and 8. Now, this is from the Message Bible. It's a paraphrase, okay? And it says this, the person who plants self uh, selfish, uh, self, selfishness, sorry, I can't even say that word, ignoring the, the, the needs of others, they harvest a crop of weeds. And all, and all he'll have to show for his life is weeds. But the one who plants in response to God. See, when God says love, do you remember when he talked to Peter? Love my sheep. Peter didn't have the sheep yet. But he said, love And God gives us wisdom, beloved. He gives us tools like boundaries and parameters to put around people who are unhealthy. But he never tells us to abandon the course of love. But we do because of brokenness, pain, fear, and insecurities. And then he says, but the one who plants in response to God, letting God's spirit to do the uh, the, the growth work in him, harvest the crop of real life and eternal life. This principle of sowing and reaping, we see that. What we sow, we do reap. Hebrews 10, 24, 25 says this, let us think of ways to motivate one another to, uh, to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We are at the cups, beloved. That if we can't do this here, how are we going to live with people who walk in a pattern of sin and iniquity? How are we ever going to love those that are unlovable if we can't even do with the community that God has given us? Many of us have let go of our our safety net, because we want to preserve ourselves. You see, God did not intend for any of us to go through life alone. Community is God's answer to running well, to walking in freedom, and to fighting for our faith. You were made to share your life with others. Now, it is time for us to find people. It's time for us to find people who will support us through life, who will rejoice with you in your victories and weep in your troubles. It will require connection. It will require that you fight for the right things with your relationships. Just because you come to church, as I said before, and you say hello to people, it doesn't mean you're connecting. And that brings me to second point. When we walk with others, we run well with others, it's supportive. There is an old Zambian uh, proverb that says, when you run alone, you run fast. But when you run together, you run far. The only way you're going to finish the race well and not burn out is by having other people involved in your life through meaningful relationship. Like I said, 
I have a whole slew of relationships. Some of them are less meaningful than others, but I don't abandon the measurement of love. I don't abandon the call to love others. I ask God for wisdom because I need to guard my heart that measure, that treasure that God has given all of us, that great deposit, we need to guard that in order for us to make sure that we love as we should God and others. It is amazing. It's a dilemma that everybody goes through. It's all about human beings. It's just what it is. We long to be close, but we also fear being close. Huh? Isn't that true? We long to have intimacy with others, but we're also scared to death of it. The fact is, is the reason we are not good with relationship is that we are led by fear and insecurities in our past. You can't get close to somebody if there's fear and insecurities. You know that. We have issues with that. And yet, if fear, if fear and insecurities destroys relationship, then what builds them? What will build our relationship? It's love. Love builds relationship. The Bible says this in 1 John 4, 18. It says, love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love for ourselves. The whole understanding that he sent his son for us, what we have gained, what we have, the power, you know, everything that he's given us. And yet, we find ourselves in, with relationships always building according to fear. See, how does love expel all fear? This is what it does. Love takes the focus off of who? You. And puts it on others. You see, many of us are very, very self-focused, and so we are forever preserving and trying to keep ourselves from being wounded again. What if I told you there was a better way to do it? When you know you are deeply loved by God and identify with what the truth says about you, then you start building connection. And when unhealthy people come or people who have issues and are difficult and might misuse your access, God will give you wisdom and discernment in how to walk with them. And you know, beloved, you're not going to win them all. There are many people I've had to put parameters against when they are demanding of me something that I know I can't give them because I don't have to. I usually put a parameter. I usually lower my access. And unfortunately, instead of them seeing that the reason why I do it, they think I've rejected them. And it has nothing to do with it. What I do is I do this for a season so that I can preserve my relationship with you, so that I can preserve my ability to love you in the long run. Because I'm not in it for the short run. I'm in it for the long run. So when things are not well in my relationships, I pull back and I say, God, show me how do I do this? We're about to start a course on Sunday evening called Good Boundaries and Good Goodbyes. Yes, they could be good. And yet we know that we don't have these resources. Many of us, the reason why we cannot love people, the reason why we sit on our seats and never get involved with anybody, it's not because you're too busy or you're tidal. No, it is because fundamentally something inside of you has been broken because of relationships. And you know, we are not who we're supposed to be if we can't love. It's a great call but he doesn't ask you to love in your own strength. He says, if you go forth, I am going to give you love in my strength. And when that starts happening, you don't go back to self-preserving. You go back building this type of relationship. When you know you're deeply loved by God, fear will be expelled. It won't be about the people. It'll be about you saying, God, show me how. Because you know that your identity and your self-worth are not caught up in what others might think of you. You know, we're so afraid to be exposed when we walk intimately with people because we're afraid we're going to be rejected. We're afraid that people might not like what they see, and therefore, they just don't want to experience that, so they never let people in. When you're secure in your relationship to Christ, you're no longer pressured by everybody, what they're expecting of you or what they're saying for you. See, God's love frees you to love others fearlessly, no matter the cost. And this brings me to the last point. 
Why is it important to run well together? It's smarter. You thought I was smart? I am. I love this. You see, when I first came to the Lord, it was the first thing that he asked me to do, walk with other people. Uh, you think I came like this. No, 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 no. I had a journey. I came actually dif- dysfunctionally relationship-wise. I was the height of the person who would actually do all things in order to self-preserve. There is no way that I can bring people in. And when God started showing me these truths about togetherness, I couldn't fight it. And all I can do is say, okay, if you want me to do that, you better go before me. And lo and behold, yeah, there were some really bad moments. You're going, yee, that was tough. But I would get back up and say, God, no, the truth says this. And I'm just not tapping into it the right way. I just don't know how to walk with people. Teach me, Lord. Give me wisdom. Show me how to love like this. You know when people would walk with Jesus and Jesus would just look at them and the compassion, they'd all start crying because he just lived and moved according to the Father's will. And we need to live and move according to the the Father's will when it comes to relationships. I have to tell you, most of the time we don't. And that's why we stay broken. That's why we don't get healed. God is calling us to love fearlessly. It's smarter. He says, when you, when you learn how to walk with others and not just yourself, Proverbs 26, 28, 26 says, whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. You know, <laughs> nobody's actually speaking to you because you don't let anybody speak to you. So the Proverbs says you're a fool when you do that. He says, in other words, if you're the only one who thinks something and nobody agrees with you, you may be walking in the wrong direction and you don't even know it. When you walk by yourself through life, you don't have anybody to say, hey, you're off the path. What, 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 why are you doing this? Get back onto the path. Go back to doing the right things, the right direction. You need to fight for the right things. When you're walking alone, nobody's keeping you accountable. Five healthy things for relationships you want to build is trust. And so many of us trust the bridge has been broken over and over and over again. And so instead of facing and looking at that individual relationship when it's been broken, you put it to everybody else. You see, this person did to me this a long time ago. Everybody else is going to do it. It keeps you from walking the way you should be walking with God. No, no, put it in its place. Just because you've gone through this and maybe some other people are looking similar to that person, it doesn't mean they're going to do the same. You have to trust something bigger than your emotions, than your past, than your experiences. Ephesians 4, 16 says, as each part does its own special work, all of us have our own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. You see, I've experienced this with this body for the last many years. I have been honored. I have been blessed by a people who want to do truth. You want truth truth to dictate your perspective. I have been the recipient of your love. And I have to tell you, it's not because I have a title. It's because I do life intentionally. And it's not because I don't fear, because there are times my knees are knocking. But if God calls me to it, I know that he's going to equip me for it. But so many of us, that's not our measurement. You've got to have other people in your life to help you grow into the person God made you to be. Life is about relationships. God is love, and he wants you to learn to love him first and then love others. Those are the two greatest commandments. Who in your life, this is the question, I'm coming to an end. Who in your life is helping you set your pace? Some of us, some of you are sprinting, and you're not going to make the long haul. How do you stop sprinting with others? Other people will say, what are you doing? Slow down. Measure your steps. Don't run after this. I'm so thankful for my pastoral team and many others here who speak into my life. You see, you know, you might be doing a little bit too much. Just a few weeks ago, I got a lot of my tests back in regards to the heart issues that I've been having. And you'll be happy to know that a lot of you have been praying that God would keep me and keep me whole and healthy. And 
and you don't want me to go down that road. I don't want to go down that road neither. And all I can do is just quote Colossians 1, 17. God, you are before all things, therefore you will hold all things. My little problem is not too big for him. But all I know is that when I saw the results and my doctor said to me, really, I don't see any risk for your, your, your heart. We see nothing. There is nothing going on with your heart. So all I can say is that probably you're a little anxious. I went, hmm, hmm, anxious. I didn't know. But you know what? I started understanding that there are many places that I've let people in, but there are one place in particular that I had a hard time with. And that is what I go through with my husband's journey. And we've just talked about it just the other day, so he knows I'm okay sharing this from the pulpit. Just, you know, just talking to him and crying and sharing with him my pain is what healthy does. You see, healthy relationships is that I'm not afraid to get any ramification when I share my heart with my husband, when I tell him what makes me hurt the most, what I grieve the most, what I lose, what I long for the most. And, you know, when we are healthy, we can do that with one another. And I, I, I started understanding that because I'm not processing the grief well, I started becoming anxious. And so I asked God, what did you want me to do? And through 2 Corinthians, the last chapter, he says to me, why don't you do what Paul does? You see, Paul had to write really hard letters to the Corinthian church because they were very dysfunctional. And at the end of that, that, that letter, he says to them, you know, I know that I brought you sorrow with what I had brought to you, but my intent was that I wanted you to grow. I wanted you to be well and to heal. But he says, I know what it is to need comfort. He says, because Titus comes to me and comforts me. I'm going, hey, here's the apostle Paul who needs comfort. And do you know what? Many of you in the last two weeks have been so comforting to me. My family has been comforting to me. My husband has been comforting to me. And I started realizing it's okay. I realized my reality. I needed to accept it that all things would change with me and my husband. And it was okay. But it wasn't okay to deal with the pain that I was going through. I was too afraid to deal with the pain deep down of me losing my husband and the measures that I've had him all of these years. Bottom line, I wasn't trusting God. He said, please start processing your pain and your anxiety will go down. And I believe that this is what he told me to do. And he told me to change some things and I put them into effect right off the bat. I'm not going to wait a year. I'm not going to wait two months. I'm going to do it now. Why wait? It's too costly. If God says do this, then you should do it. So my walk with my husband is precious to me. It's just changed. But I need to deal with my pain, my loss. But I want to thank those who have sat in the, in the hospital with me for hours waiting for tests, for those who gave me scriptures and prayed for me, for those who said, you're going to be okay. Because you see, that's what the community believers do. We walk together. We speak together. We share our hearts together. We are real. We are trust. We're, we, we show trust. We are truthful. We're transparent. We're tender, meaning it's grace. When I make mistakes, you give me a lot of wiggle room. Yay! Because that's what God gives me every day. And we do things together. So who's watching out for you? You need people who will defend you, stand up for you and protect you, help you stay on track and warn you. We will all need this because we all have blind spots, beloved. Our blind spots are used by the enemy to keep us captive, for keep us not walking in community. God has given us much and we do a lot of pushbacks because fear is what governs us, not the spirit. So who will motivate you to run that race that is before you? Answering that question this morning is your first step in running well. Philippians 2.4 says, look out for one another's interest, not just your own. We're family. We're family. We are brothers and sisters in God's family. We should care for one another. We should defend each other. We should help each other run this race. We should keep each other focused and impart encouragement so we can have the strength to run well. The community of God 
is the answer to running well and getting to the finish line. You need to find people who will stand with you through tough times and say, we are not going anywhere. If you're discouraged, we're going to speak encouragement to you. We're not going to let you get depressed. We're not going to get you to keep yourself in that place of worry. We're going to stay here with you. We're going to keep you accountable. We're going to put parameters when you're unhealthy with me. I'm going to put boundaries around you because I don't want to lose my relationship with you. That's what boundaries are about. I want to finish off with this last verse, Ecclesiastes 4.12. It says, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Could it be your fear of being exposed, your fear of intimacy and relationship is not really based on truth, but maybe some thing, some point of references in your past that keeps you so locked up emotionally that you can't give from that place. Could it be that your measurement is not based on what God says about you, but what you've heard over a period of time, the messages that were over you, where your identity is so caught up in what you do and not who you are? You are a beloved child of God, warmly welcome into his kingdom 24-7. You have been given forgiveness and compassion. You have been given everything you need to run this race well. And yet, when it comes to community, beloved, we do this. Because we don't trust that God will be faithful over his word. He says, no matter what you go through, I will. Anytime you hear, I will, is God telling you, I'm on this. I'm on this. So, we were never meant to run alone. So, if God is sharing with you, I'm going to ask the worship to come up. If God is coming after this, as I told you, I warned you, this is a sticky spot. Because when it comes to relationships, some of us have a lot of difficult relationships around us. And you don't have a lot of good voices right now. And I am so sorry to hear that. But I do know that God could train you and teach you with the resource of community to do life well with others despite the difficulties. Don't back down. Don't settle for less. Many of you have just given up. You're given up on relationship because you see that there's no possibility. You think you're going crazy. But I'm here to tell you you're not. I'm here to tell you God can heal you. God can teach you how to go to him for what you need. And others are just bonuses. People will just be a blessing. Do I have difficult times? I do. Have I been hurt and betrayed? I have. Have I hurt in the past? Yes. Did I learn to put parameters and boundaries? I did. And because of it, on whole, many of my relationships are becoming more and more healthy. When things happen and it affects your well-being, beloved, it's usually because you're not putting any boundaries to keep the bad out and to embrace what God is asking you to do it. I just felt that the Lord was just saying, it's a time to build. You need to do it now. And you have many people here are for God. They want to learn how to love this way. They're going to make mistakes. They might not even do it well at times. But trust me, God is getting a hold with all of your hearts. I see this with a lot of people who actually write me for when they listen to a message and say, God is exactly doing this. See, God is on the move right now. He's moved you quite a bit in the last several months. And now he's just pushing you to that place and say, trust me with the relationships. Let me teach you how to do this. Don't run with your fears. Don't run by sight. Walk in faith. Are you ready to do that? Can you come up and just cry out to God and say, God, I, I, I want healthy. Start here. Start new habits in how I deal with people. Let me be aware of how I do my dysfunction, how I fight people off in my own life. God, I'm going to be real with you. I don't love people. 
Ah, couldn't care less for people. I just want to do life. Leave me alone. But you have missed the greatest call is to love beyond your measure. If this is the call you have today, God, I want more. Then you come on up and ask God to touch you today. Hallelujah. Had been shut down for years. She was a mighty warrior, yet she couldn't connect emotionally to anyone. And she had been shut down for many, many years. At one point or another, she realizes that fear has kept her from ever expressing the pain of the trauma that she has lived all her life. And that fear kept her in this prison where she couldn't connect with her very own daughter. And when she comes to that real realization that she wasn't fearing something on the outside, but she was fearing the pain in her, something just clicked in my head. And that's where my journey started because I realized that God was trying to speak to me about the pain of loss. Today you heard many people crying out, asking God to help them because some of you are experiencing pain and wounds because of relationships. Trust me when I tell you, your greatest safety net is God's community. But you'll never experience it if you're not willing to trust God. He kind of knew what he was doing when he called us the body of Christ. He didn't make a mistake. So we need to start building and I believe that most of you have today. Let me pray for you today. I, I, I am speechless in regards to what God and how God has spoken to you very, very clearly. And if you're here today and you don't know the God of love that I've just talked about, then you need to make that decision first. You need to receive him as Savior and Lord. You need to acknowledge your sin and say, God, I, I am... I am not free to love. I am not free to let people in. But you say you can do this through me. And if you're there, just invite him in today. Invite him in as Lord and Savior. And he will come in and he will bust out those areas that are full of pain and wound. And he will heal you like no other. Let me pray for you guys today. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you're more than able and willing to come as we cry out to you. This is why you sent your son. This is why he did all the work. All we need to do is believe. And God, I believe in my heart that you have done something in the heavenlies here today on earth. God, you have shaken foundations that have kept us captive, Lord, when it comes to relationships. And God, we say no more. God, today we say we will not settle for less. God, we will fight. We will put parameters. We will go with boundaries, Lord, until we see health again, God. Until we see res restoration and healing in our relationships, God. We will not bow down to darkness, God. We will say, God, here we are. Show us, Lord. God, touch our marriages. Touch our own homes. Touch our children. God, touch our families today, God. And let us be conduits of your love to them, Lord. Please forgive us, Lord, that we made it about us. But today, God, we rise up to be your vessel. And God, we thank you. We thank you, God, because we are answering the call. Here I am, send me, Lord. With your strength and your grace, Lord. Give us revelation today, God, and solidify the message that you spoke to us this day. In Jesus' name, I pray. I want to thank you for coming today. Please, if you just got a little bit, then go and listen to it again. If you want to join us with this, uh, this course tonight, even though you haven't read and you're not, you didn't follow through, you come and sit down and hear. Because I truly believe the reason why we're so broken is because we've never understood boundaries were God's idea. We need to understand how to do new life differently. Amen? I want to thank you for coming. May God bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you today. As we finish off the last song, please say hi to everybody and spend time getting to know people. Hi. Hi, Ben.